Welcome to chapter 6, secondary activities of class 12 NCRT. So what is the first thing that comes to our mind when we hear the word secondary activities? It's always going to be manufacturing because manufacturing involves creating things. And when you're creating things, you're adding a lot of value to it. And that's the kind of job that falls under secondary activities. Now if you look around and see all the objects, everything is made up of some or the other sort of natural resource. Now it is the job of the secondary activities people to convert that raw material into valuable products. Now what I mean by that is, let's take an example of clothes that you're wearing. Suppose if you're wearing a specific type of cloth which is cotton cloth. Now you must be familiar with the fact that cotton is a plant. And by the way it is processed, you are able to get a cloth out of it. And that's what you're wearing right now. So I hope you're understanding the transformation that is taking place from primary sector to secondary sector. That is what I mean when I say that secondary activities add value to the product. Similarly, you can take an example of iron ore. So iron ore is a mineral that is found in mines. Now you cannot directly take it and use it, right? You need to first convert it into proper structured steel so that you can use that to build infrastructure. So the extracting part from the mine is the job of primary sector people and converting that into a solid steel is the job of secondary activities people. So the final conclusion is that the job of people working in secondary activities is to add value to the product. So the first topic that we will read under this chapter is manufacturing. So the other meaning of the word manufacturing is simply production. Anything that you make directly falls under manufacturing category. Now you understand the meaning of the word manufacturing, but there is another important aspect associated with it. And that is the ability to produce more, meaning mass production. So if you are able to make hundreds and thousands and lakhs of units of one particular thing, then you have a large production unit which we call it as manufacturing industry. Because the whole purpose of the manufacturing sector is to serve to the economy, to the nation. So if you're not having a mass production unit, then it gets very difficult because there is a huge population that needs to be fed. In other words, you have to supply to meet the demand. And to do that, you will need extreme help from modern power and machineries because it's, it's almost impossible to put humans behind it and make them produce thousands and lakhs of units of a particular product. And that's going to be time consuming and time is something that the manufacturing sector is particular about. Hence, you need heavy machineries. However, there is a catch. If you go to most of the third world countries, I'm talking about countries like Bangladesh, Africa, so there the work is still done in literal sense. What I mean by that is humans are doing it with their own hands. I mean, there is very minimum uh, machinery involved. And what is the reason behind it? That's a whole different story. Because then we'll go into the aspects of why their particular government is not spending behind infrastructure. So that's a whole different story for a different topic. So here we are just going to focus on the manufacturing aspect of a particular country. Now we're going to read about characteristics of modern large scale manufacturing. When we say characteristics, we mean the advantages, strengths, the area of expertise. So the first one is specialization of skills or methods of production. Now this quality is quite common in big modern factories. Here the labor force is divided into departments and accordingly workload is distributed so that each worker performs only one task repeatedly. So this way there is no delay in the production line and over the time the workers become specialist in that line of work. And the second quality is mechanization. To accomplish any work, you need tools. To finish a bigger job, you need bigger and better tools. In modern factories, automation plays a very important role. It saves time, energy and increases productivity. You can see a lot of computer controlled machines in automobile industries. And the third quality is technological innovation. For this, a factory must need a strong research and development, that is R&D department. The work of R&D department is to constantly look for new technologies and better ways to accomplish a task. That's why the company that spends more on R&D has cutting edge technologies to solve their problems. And the next one is organizational structure and stratification. Now this one over here purely means the organizational management. Now if you look at all these points, they are pretty much the steps that is followed in a large modern manufacturing industry. You will find complex machine technology, meaning robots and automated machines. Then you will find the work is divided into different departments so that individually if you finish the parts, that will together finish the entire work. Then these factories have huge capital investment for functioning any break will cause huge loss. 
they also have large organizations meaning so many employees and always remember more employees means more productivity and that will lead to more growth and finally there will be an administrative branch that deals with the policy making and decision making roles this is an authoritative role wherein major decisions regarding company's future is determined now we're going to read about uneven geographic distribution now if you see the world map there are very few places where manufacturing has developed and it's due to various factors like location availability of resources then geopolitics economic development and many other factors now if an industry has to make profit always remember it has to reduce cost for that it has to be nearer to the resources by resources i mean natural resources labor power transportation etc all of this adds up to the production cost so there are very few places in the world where you will find all of this at one place that's why geographic distribution is uneven it is not equal now let's read about some of the factors influencing the industrial locations first one is access to market in order to keep an industry going there has to be a market the meaning of market is where people can buy that is where demand is there and purchasing power that is money is there and if you look at the world map the regions of europe or north america japan and australia are the global markets where the demand and purchasing power is very high and if we have to speak about asia then india and china forms a large market purely because of their huge population the second factor is access to raw material without raw material industries are empty so the entire cost of the product that is produced is heavily determined by the fact that how close is the industry to the source of raw material for example if iron industry is closer to iron ore mines then the cost of transportation will be less and cost of iron would be cheap similarly if agro processing and dairy industry are closer to farm then the products would not get damaged and the third factor is access to labor supply industries need labor or workers even if there is automation or robot you still need workers so labor supply or human resources is very important for an industry and the fourth one is access to transportation and communication facilities improvement in transportation facilities decreases the cost of production because if you are spending behind long distance transportation that will take up a lot of money and communication facilities helps in the exchange and management of information which helps the industry to function globally with accuracy and efficiency then we have government policy industries boosts economic development of a region therefore government does a lot to promote industrial development in terms of giving incentives like reducing taxes import duties power concessions etc and the final factor is access to agglomeration economies that is links between industries so the meaning of agglomeration is a collection of things so when we say agglomeration economies we mean collection of economies if industries are located nearby to each other they tend to mutually benefit from each other in terms of services adaptation of technology methods ideas etc so these were the factors influencing the industrial locations now we're going to read about the ways in which manufacturing industries is divided it's purely to understand the secondary activity in much more depth so here's a picture that shows the overall classification we're going to first understand the classification of industries based on size it is easy to understand that if an industry is big and massive there's a lot of investment that goes into it then the amount of workers working there would be large so classification based on size is something we understand but under this we have three more categories let's get to know each one of them the first one is household industries or cottage manufacturing the moment the word household comes it has to be a small manufacturing unit because most of it is being done in your house or backyard or some small garage sort of place so here the output is also low it's not huge because artisans who are also the workers here use simple tools and local raw materials to produce goods hence there isn't much profit involved when there isn't much profit automatically capital investment is also low and would affect the whole production unit some examples of products produced in this sector of manufacturing include food stuffs fabrics mats containers tools furniture shoes jewelry and other fancy items the second category is small scale manufacturing now this one is entirely different from household industries please don't get confused between both of them in this kind of manufacturing there are simple power driven machines and semi skilled labors involved 
Usually there will be small workshop where the work is carried out. Then small supply and demand will be there. So in overall sense, these are a little bigger commercially when compared to household industries. Countries like India, China, Indonesia and Brazil have developed labor intensive small scale manufacturing industries. And the third one is large scale manufacturing. Now this one does not need any introduction. This kind of industry has a large market, access to large portion of raw materials, enormous energy, specialized workers, advanced technology and mass production is common here. Today this kind of manufacturing is spread across the world and they contribute significantly to a nation's economy. Now let's understand industries based on inputs raw materials. As raw materials are the basic requirement for any industry to grow, hence we will break down the industry based on raw materials they use. Under this, the first one is agro-based industries, meaning agricultural raw materials. So most of the raw materials comes from the field and the farm and they are made into finished products from rural and urban markets. The kind of industries that fall in this category are food processing, sugar, pickles, fruit juices, beverages like tea, coffee and cocoa, spices and oils and textiles like cotton, jute, silk, rubber etc. The second one is mineral based industries. Here minerals are used as raw material. A good example would be iron and steel industries. They use ferrous metallic minerals. Then we have other industries like aluminium, copper and jewellery industries which use non-ferrous metallic minerals. And then there are cement and pottery industries who do not use any metallic minerals. The third one is chemical based industries. Usage of chemicals are the speciality of these industries. We have petroleum industry that uses chemicals to, to convert crude oil into refined petroleum and petrochemical products. Then salts, sulfur and potash industries also use natural minerals. Then synthetic fiber, plastic are used with some chemicals to produce more durable products. So this is all the job of chemical based industries. The fourth one is forest based raw material using industries. The products that are made in this industry is purely out of forest resources like trees, wood, bamboo, grass, paper industry, furniture industry thrives on this type of resources. And the fifth one is animal based industries. Leather for leather industry and wool for woolen textiles are obtained from animals. There isn't much to understand about this. Animals are the raw materials for some of humans unnecessary wants. Now we'll try to understand industries based on output or product. So this kind of industries are those whose products are used to make goods and by using those goods as raw materials, there are other industries making a living on it. What I mean by that is, textile industry produces clothes and then there are small business owners who use clothes to make various type of garments for consumer. For these small business owners, clothes are raw material for their businesses. I hope you got what I just said. Similarly, iron and steel industries produces iron and steel sheets and bars. Now there are industries who take these iron sheets and bars to make structural frame or machines or tools. So here we can say that raw material for such machines and tools is iron and steel. I hope you understood this point. Now we have industries based on ownership. The first one is public sector industries. Government is the owner of these industries. They are also known as public sector undertakings. Some examples are Bhail, Bharat Heavy Electronic Limited, then Coal India, then Sale, that is Steel Authority of India, then Gale, Gas Authority of India, then we have Indian Oil Corporation, NTPC, etc. The second one is Private Sector Industries. It is owned by individual investors. These are what we call as private organizations. Some examples are Reliance Industries Limited, Tata Consultancy Services, Infosys Technologies, Wipro Limited, Bharti Airtel, ITC Limited, ICICI Bank, etc. And the third one is joint sector industries. The shareholders in this industry is both the government as well as a private investor. They get into some sort of partnership to run a joint sector industry. Then the fourth one is missing here but it is known as cooperative industries. Here the industries rely on each other based on some mutual cooperation. Now we are going to read about traditional large scale industrial regions. So when we say traditional industry, we are referring to metal, heavy engineering, chemical manufacture and textile production industries. Basically industries with big chimney through which smoke comes out. Now these traditional industries provide large amount of employment. With that comes human settlement near the industrial area. 
the environment around these industries are unattractive because of pollution, smoke, waste dumps, etc. And over the time, these traditional industries have gone down due to fallen demand, which has been the prime reason for unemployment, then unsettled land area disputes and many other issues. So these are some of the concerns associated with traditional large-scale industrial region. Let's read about the Ruhr Coal Field Germany. It has been one of the major industrial regions of Europe for a long time. The Ruhr region was responsible for 80% of Germany's total steel production. But as the demand for coal declined, the industry started shrinking. This region is now replaced with new industries like the huge Opel car assembly plant, new chemical plants, universities, then out of town shopping centers. So this is a perfect example of what happens when manufacturing industries go through transformation with time. Now let's quickly understand what is the concept of high technology industry. Well it simply means an industry having high tech gadgets which is the latest generation of manufacturing activities. These are formed after intensive research and development. Some of the features of such industry are robotics on the assembly line, computer aided design, electronic controls of smelting and refining processes and the constant development of new chemical and pharmaceutical products. The environment around these industries are neatly spaced, low modern office buildings rather than massive assembly structures, factories, chimneys and storage areas. These areas are so called technopolis. Some examples are the Silicon Valley near San Francisco and Silicon Forest near Seattle. Then in India, Bengaluru is known as the hub of information technology. And the last topic is iron and steel industry and cotton textile industry. I'll cover this topic in a separate short video because it needs proper attention with the help of map work and other necessary details. So I'll cover them in a different video. With this, we have come to an end of this video. The question answers are available on the website. Link to that is in the description as well as in the info card right up there. One more thing, I want you all to click on this little icon on my YouTube homepage. So this little icon will take you to a small feedback form wherein I'll need your inputs so that it helps me in improving the content for a better learning experience. I hope you will head over there and fill it. Thanks for watching the video and I'll see you in the next one. If you enjoyed these videos and see a purpose behind watching them, please like the video and comment down below. Until then, catch you guys later and talk to you guys on the next one. Peace.